Okay. Um, right, so good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Simon. Um, I work for a company called Worldwide Technology. Uh, you probably never heard of us. We're um, actually the probably the IT industry's best kept secret. Um, more about that a little bit later on. Uh, just an intro for me. Um, see some of the uh, prestigious companies I've worked for um, in the past. Um, now, I've actually got a, a nice sort of special thing that I'm going to announce with you tonight. Um, I'm actually celebrating 30 years in the IT industry. So I've put a question mark on that. <laughs> I've put a question mark on that, and you'll see why in a minute. <laughs> That's what I looked like back in <laughs> 1994. So if you've worked in the IT industry for as long as I have, this is what happens to you. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I'm just really, uh, I'm not really a sort of a huge techie, so my, my focus is really kind of working with um, our customers to make sure that they have a good strategy in terms of how they're really uh, migrating to the cloud. If they're already in the cloud, how we can help them uh, sort of optimize that. Uh, and also to uh, make sure that organizations have the right sort of strategy when it comes to cloud. That's kind of really my, uh, one of my main sort of uh, roles. Um, so I'll be kind of just talking very quickly about a few areas, just kind of pointing out a few uh, items to you uh, around things like um, journey to the cloud, so how people have actually sort of migrated over the last few years, uh, looking at uh, things like the sort of migration strategies, some of the things that have actually uh, worked in, um, in how sort of organizations have uh, migrated to the cloud. Um, and then kind of how, you know, why, why is it so important to actually have a, a good uh, architecture when you actually come to um, migrating to the cloud? And we'll kind of just drop some uh, conclusions uh, towards the end. Um, I will try and give you some time for Q&A, so I promise to do that, so at least five minutes, if not more, uh, and we'll see how we get on. Okay, so, uh, journey to the cloud. I guess that's probably one of the best ways to, to describe what a cloud is. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think digital disruption is probably one of the main things um, that is affecting the way organizations are actually looking at IT and how they really move forward with their uh, you know, infrastructure, how they move with their designs, how they move with their architecture going forward. Uh, so we've seen the rise, obviously, of things like public cloud, uh, and we've kind of seen the um, sort of the, the reduction in uh, on-premises uh, technology as well, and all of that's kind of converging um, off-premise as well, uh, being kind of part of that. Uh, but kind of that's all sort of converging around this area, uh, where really organisations are moving to a cloud architecture, if not a multi-cloud architecture. And actually, I do have a few customers that are. Uh, doing multi-cloud, which is great. So, you shouldn't really just move to the cloud or use cloud technology just for the sake of it. Okay, that's really important. Uh, the, you know, the idea is that you actually try and take advantage of the cloud technology properly versus actually having just say, well, we'll just use container, just put it into a container or throw it into, you know, into Kubernetes or something. That's really important. Okay, so I, I put this chart together. I've been kind of developing this for uh, a number of years now. And the idea really is just to, uh, for my customers really, I normally tend to sort of whiteboard this with them, but um, what I'm trying to really just kind of show customers the journey to the cloud and how you know, they themselves or other organizations have sort of moved uh, across sort of from, you know, from, uh, uh, from left to right. So on the, um, on the sort of the left-hand side, we have uh, things like the sort of the traditional IT technology, um, the heritage data center, um, and all of the sort of technologies and solutions that are uh, in that space. Um, so you can't call it legacy, by the way. I'm not allowed to say that. It has to be heritage. Uh, so traditional IT, we've had sort of you know compute, storage, networking, etc., all sort of happening uh, in that space, and that's been kind of developing um, uh, over the last few years. So that's really uh, where things like monolithic applications really sort of run at the moment, uh, and. You, you may be surprised to hear, but around 80% of applications are still in the data center. So, uh, despite all of the sort of movements into into cloud, um, one of the sort of um, 
technologies or areas of technology that kind of developed over the last years is what I call sort of transitional IT. And this was kind of a really a knee-jerk reaction to the traditional uh, data center technologies and where customers really wanted to or organizations wanted to really get out of some of the licensing, crippling licensing that was happening in there and some of the monopolies that were in traditional IT. So they adopted a, a number of technologies including things like hyper-converged, uh, OpenStack in terms of open source, um, and uh, looked at things like software-defined data center, and it's kind of got a little bit ridiculous with things like software-defined infrastructure, and then you had software-defined everything, and on and on and on. Uh, but I, I kind of really think that um, transitional IT is kind of really exactly what it says. It's, it's transitional. You're kind of a step, you know, in the in the other direction, you're going to going into into the cloud. And really, in cloud is where really sort of obviously everything is happening at the moment. So we have obviously private clouds, hybrid clouds, etc. Um, and kind of the first foray into that was maybe kind of, you know, moving some uh, non-production workloads and putting those into instances in things like AWS. Uh, so that was kind of the first uh, sort of phase of um, you know, of moving into the cloud. And that's where things like you know, shadow IT started happening and, you know, CFO started panicking about bills and monthly bills and, and things like that. So in there you saw, again, um, you know, for, for private clouds, you saw things like hyper-converged, OpenStack, uh, and so on all happening. And then uh, the likes of sort of uh, containers and orchestration really sort of came in as a sort of a second piece. So while people were kind of figuring out, you know, how to get sort of applications migrated, you had sort of containers and orchestration uh, sort of crash, crash the party. Um, and again, in, in that area, obviously things like Docker uh, and Kubernetes were really sort of the leaders in that space. The specific workloads, I think, have continued to really be quite a pain um, in terms of both uh, how you actually migrate those as well as in terms of the licensing, how do you actually deal with the licensing for those. So things like uh, SAP and Oracle uh, workloads continue to remain really in the data center. Or maybe they kind of go off-premises uh, into an MSP environment. And then as we were sort of getting used to containers and orchestration, um, you know, you had to kind of also contend with, you know, re-classifying uh, or rewriting your applications into in a more agile way. So things like DevOps happened and, and microservices started really coming in. And along with that, technologies like obviously making your applications more modular, um, you know, looking at the whole sort of uh, and categorizing the soft, software development lifecycle, um, Using CI/CD pipelines to to you know to to push out your code, uh, using Agile for actually uh, developing you know, your code, uh, and automating that sort of process. And as we were doing that, and we thought, okay, yes, we're great. We've got it all nice and you know nice and automated. It's all working fine. We're a DevOps shop, fantastic. And then somebody said, uh, what about security? And I went, oh, right, yes, forgot about that. So we need to actually inject some security in there. So things like DevSecOps is now, I mean, if you've noticed, you've probably uh, uh, kind of seen quite a lot of uh, focus on that recently. So DevSecOps is kind of really coming in to have security baked into the CI CD pipeline. And that's, again, quite important because that needs to really comply with the rest of the organization's um, security policy. But obviously, the Nirvana is really kind of to try and really get to serverless and infrastructure as code. That's where you sort of take advantage of things like spot instances, um, where you automate the whole process, uh, and obviously, you know, still have things like uh, DevSecOps in there. Now, I call um, in, uh, platforms that actually generate the environment for you as kind of world engines. Um, I took that out of the Man of Steel, I think. If anybody seen Superman? Was a Superman fan. Uh, so basically, you have you know you describe the world that you want, and an engine generates the world for you. So things like you know, AWS Lambda, etc. That's really the idea with those, um, and that's really what's obviously driving uh, a lot of this sort of workloads that uh, organisations really are trying to strive for, trying to go towards at the moment. And that's really kind of the the customer journey. Um, so the idea with this is really that you. You know, kind of show what customers um, is happening. You get, uh, give them an opportunity to be able to actually talk about it, maybe kind of point to where they might be along that journey and what's to come, what else they can actually do as well. So it's a good way to, to actually have a conversation or start a conversation with customers. Okay, so on to uh, migration strategies. Um, 
So if anybody says that actually migrating to the cloud is because we can save some money, it's, you can, they can forget that. Uh, that's really not the idea of why you'd want to go to the cloud or why you'd want to put some uh, workloads into the cloud. The idea is really to actually achieve sort of some of those top ones up there, things like you know, flexibility, agility. Uh, I'm quite surprised actually that they don't have independence in this list because one of the things that you ought to be striving for when you're actually doing it in the cloud is, um, is independence from any underlying platforms. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's kind of really the, uh, the idea of that. So the more that you kind of aim your strategy, strategy towards uh, those sort of higher points up there, the, you know, the, the better that you are in terms of actually achieving your goals um, and taking full advantage of um, you know, your, your, your cloud workloads or, or cloud um, uh, deployments. Okay, so how can you migrate? Um, well, there's a number of ways that you can do it. I'm sure every consultancy out there will give you their sort of version of it. But the industry is kind of boiled down to this sort of standard of the six R's, the way of actually migrating applications or looking at how you can you know, uh, migrate applications into the cloud. So that goes everything from um, sort of you know, keeping it on-prem, so that's actually an option, um, uh, to things like uh, retiring the application, so it's just too old, have an old CRM system, um, you know, not really worth moving it into the cloud, let's just go to you know, Salesforce. Uh, we have an HR system, again, not worth um, you know, migrating to the cloud, let's just go to Workday. So that's kind of SaaS, essentially, kind of that sort of option is available. And then all the other ones, things like rehosting the application, so that's what other people call kind of lift and shift, um, to uh, re-platforming, so actually just putting it on a, on a different platform, um, to actually uh, looking at getting a different uh, solution altogether, um, and then down to actually rewriting or refactoring uh, the code itself, so it can be kind of more cloud native. So these are just some of the ways, I won't go through sort of all the details of that, but um, these are kind of some of the ways that organizers actually look at how they can migrate applications or look at actually assessing how they can migrate applications uh, into the cloud. Okay, so one of the other areas, of course, is data. So as your application moves to the cloud, it's probably, probably a good idea that the data goes along with it as well. So if you've got a dependency on former application looking at a database or using a database, probably probably useful to actually get the database or the data into the cloud as well. And there's a number of those, so I won't go through all of those there, but suffice to say it goes everything from sort of taking the data out of that database and putting it into maybe a more... Um, cost-effective database in the cloud, and all the way to um, you know moving uh, the, the data across with the application to taking advantage of new technologies that are actually uh, in the cloud, things like analytics and AI that you can actually apply to uh, some data that you probably had for years and years uh, in the data center uh, in, your, in your own data center and you weren't doing anything with, uh, to actually looking at you know how you can. Um, apply things like backup recovery and replication services as well. So there's loads of those available, of course, uh, as SaaS solutions. You can actually look at that uh, as a potential uh, solution for the data that you're uh, handling and managing uh, as well. Okay, so cloud native architecture. I sincerely hope that's not how you do your cloud native architecture. So what's happening here? Well, the idea really is that when you're designing um, a, a cloud-native architecture, it's actually look at everything. Uh, so I was actually, I just came out of a customer cloud workshop today, an all-day workshop, uh, and we were talking exactly about this today. So uh, not just really looking at, you know, migrating the applications, but also looking at how, um, you know, the, the overall sort of digital strategy, um, how you uh, modernize your infrastructure, so whether that survives the move or is part of the move or is not part of the move, uh, as well as actually looking at designing the, the multi-cloud architecture as well. All underpinned by that cloud native design. Okay, that's really important to do. And obviously security baked in, as we said, that's really, again, part of that process. So you need really to have your security teams uh, as part of the process involved in the design uh, as you go through to actually understand the uh, mechanisms required for that. 
Observability, if you've not heard of that term, I'm sure you have, but observability is kind of really the way to look at everything, all the metrics, all the logs, all the data that's coming out of uh, all of these platforms, be able to collate that and make some sense of it. It's kind of an inference to the, the sort of the best explanation in terms of any events and alerts and uh, failures and problems that uh, may occur. So all, all again, part of this uh, sort of strategy. So it's really important not just to look at kind of how do I migrate my low-hanging fruits of applications, put those workloads into, into the cloud, but actually the, the entire sort of process of how you do everything uh, is affected by that. So you need to really look at all of those um, aspects of, of your IT strategy. And if you kind of want to classify it and put it in various levels, I guess you can do that as well. So this kind of shows you uh, where various technologies sort of fit in. So uh, sort of infrastructure level, uh, sort of the, the developer and application level, and the sort of the consumption or services level uh, at the top. I won't go through all of that, but uh, that just kind of helps you to define where things really fit together. I guess really the probably the, the most important slide um, uh, from my presentation is this one here. So this actually shows uh, the the cloud operating model, um, uh, and the bit in the sort of the uh, the dotted um, lines there is really the probably the two most important aspects that you need to get right in terms of how you design and architect um, your cloud operating model. So in terms of connectivity or networking, we're sort of you know, seeing a shift from uh, the data center where you run things like you know, static IP addresses uh, and host-based systems. So every server is a host, and it might host one application or, or more than one application. And we see that actually going across to a dynamic IP environment in the, in the cloud. So we're, we're not actually looking at the server itself or necessarily the container or the instance that's actually running, but what is the service that's actually running in that unit of computing? Uh, that's really the important thing to look at when it comes to uh, looking at connectivity or, or networking in the cloud. And then similar thing really for security. So you're going from a sort of a high trust castle and moat sort of environment in the data center where once you're through um, the firewall, pretty much everything is, you know, trusts everything else. Um, give, or give or take a couple of uh, service accounts. Um, so you're kind of moving away from that sort of account-based environment into a more identity-based environment where really there's either low or preferably zero trust. So two containers sitting next to each other, two pods in, in Kubernetes sitting next to each other should not really trust each other. Uh, and that's really how the, you know, the, the process uh, works in, in the cloud. So going from this sort of very static data center, very kind of um, very defined, a very rigid way of doing things to a more dynamic in a multi-cloud environment, those are the two things that you really need to look at. Yes, you need to probably kind of think about how you provision things and maybe how you operate them or manage them later, but you know that's really not crucial, not as critical as getting your connectivity right and most importantly getting your security right uh, in, the, in the cloud operating model. Okay, so what can we draw from, from this? So, as we said, in terms of journey to the cloud, um, it's really about having a cloud strategy. So you must have that in place. You must actually, yes, you actually have to do some writing. You have to actually sit down and write a document. So that is really, really important. You'd be surprised how many you know, organizations I've, I've worked with that they don't actually have that. So that's really, really important to have that charter in place where everybody within the IT you know, team actually signs up to and, and supports. Um, it's useful to have, obviously, uh, a choice. So it's always good not to kind of put all your eggs in one basket. So look at maybe doing a hybrid. That's probably most likely the the solution that you'll uh, you know that you'll see with the advent of the public cloud providers all offering uh, sort of on-premises uh, solutions for their platforms. It kind of makes that sort of hybrid dotted line um, from your data center into the public cloud even more real. Uh, so look at hybrid, look at sort of, you know, obviously public and, uh, and multi as well uh, in, the, in the future. 
Um, and again, uh, in terms of kind of the computing unit sizes, so everything kind of, you know, we were sort of talking about physical servers, virtual machines in the past. Now we've sort of instances and containers and serverless and so on. So all of that kind of really uh, needs to be uh, well defined as well and understood. So not every workload necessarily needs to go into in a container environment. Not every, you know, um, uh, uh, workload needs to be in a container, it can be in a, maybe in a serverless environment as well. So again, the unit of computing is, uh, and the size of that is, is really important. What kind of services can you get in there? I'm not sure you can read that, but things like, you know, uh, look at cloud readiness. So that's kind of a service that you can go out and actually get uh, to see whether you're actually your organization is ready for the cloud. Um, so consultancies will, will help you with that. Um, and also look at, you know, have you got all the foundations for your cloud strategy in place as well? So cloud foundations uh, is another service that you can look at. When it comes to actually migrating, um, so as we said, whether you're actually, you know, looking to move to the cloud, so maybe you've tried it and it didn't really work out and you kind of, you know, didn't, didn't, um, uh, didn't really manage to, to make it work properly or you probably maybe already in the cloud if you're kind of one of the more modern and startup organizations, maybe you're already in the cloud. The, the things to actually look for there is, you know, the, the migration process we, as we saw earlier, how to actually do that and how to actually try and automate that process as much as possible. So especially when um, kind of, you know, organizations I work for, the, uh, work with um, things like the banks and the financial institutes, for example, they have hundreds if not thousands of applications. So we can't really sit there and go through those manually and figure out which one, you know, we can migrate. Once we've, you know, assessed the applications that can go across, we need to actually really automate the process of how uh, we do the migration for those applications. Um, so certainly that process is, uh, is, uh, is important to go through. Uh, and if you're already in the cloud, as you said, maybe you can kind of, you know, do some cost optimization. So look at kind of the expenditure and how you can change uh, the instances or the workloads that you have. Maybe kind of shut them down overnight and spin them back up again, you know, in the morning. Or maybe use serverless to, to do that quick financial calculation and then uh, drop out again. Uh, and that will certainly help uh, in terms of the costs uh, of running things in the cloud. Again, what sort of service you can get there? Well, probably application assessment, that's probably a good idea. Um, look at dependency mapping, so this application needs this database, so the, the data in the database might need to go across, or at least the data needs to go across. Uh, and obviously things like, you know, actually figure out what, what, what is it that you do actually have by running an asset inventory. So again, you'd be surprised at the amount of companies that actually don't, don't know, what, you know what services they have, what applications they have running in their data center, and where they are, and who looks after them, and who's the stakeholders, and, and so on. So that, again, this is quite important. Uh, when it comes to cloud native architecture, so look at the, you know, the design um, for the cloud operating models. Actually make sure that you have something in place. Um, when it comes to security, don't just copy what you have in the data center and paste that into the cloud. Uh, as we saw kind of with the, briefly with the operating model, you know, security is slightly different when it comes to uh, when it comes to a cloud design. So again, make sure that you understand that. Also, understand all the layers of security as well. Everything kind of from infrastructure to application to data to end users and so on. Uh, all of those require different tools. All of those require different ways of implementation and how they actually work in the cloud versus uh, in the in the data center. Um, and obviously, as we said, you know, look at um, applications and migrating the applications and whether those actually end up in a managed service environment. Maybe that's actually a, uh, an easier way to, to actually do it and to avoid some of those costly licenses of migrating into, uh, into the cloud uh, or actually put them into maybe directly into the cloud if that's kind of more uh, uh, efficient and cost effective. So again, uh, services there, you can look at actually how you do things like the, the concepts for uh, the, the, um, uh, the actual architecture, the cloud native architecture, uh, look at actually, you know, getting services for uh, designing uh, the architecture, um, writing the architecture itself, uh, development, so maybe you have some of those applications that need to be refactored, there are obviously organizations that will help you with uh, rewriting the applications, and all the way through to things like deployment, project management, um, and actually doing things like um, you know, monitoring and management of, of the uh, applications once they move across. I won't go through all of those, but there's obviously loads of other ones to, to actually consider as well, but suffice to say the idea is that you really want to look at all of these aspects in terms of how they're actually 
actually operating, um, what are the best choices for your organization. One size doesn't necessarily fit, uh, fit everything in, in, in every uh, occasion, so you need to really look at the workload, uh, assess the workload and see how that would really live in a cloud uh, environment. Okay, um, that's kind of really the main slides I had. So I won't talk about worldwide uh, technology, so that's the organization I work for. Uh, so just a quick shameless plug for them. Had to do it, sorry. Um, yeah, so we are, we are a global solutions provider, basically. And, um, and we um, are an essentially an independent consultancy organization. Um, and the, the focus that we have is really to provide customers sort of everything from, um, you know, from the point of an idea to, to an outcome. Uh, that's kind of how uh, Worldwide works. Um, and obviously we have a, a cloud practice. Uh, so that's really the idea of turning uh, a full cloud a full cloud concept into uh, into a reality. Uh, so we've been around for some time. Um, I was saying earlier to somebody probably uh, best kept secret of the IT industry. Um, Eleven billion dollar turnover, so not doing too badly. Uh, privately held, which means we're not actually answerable to any shareholders. Also, it means uh, we are quite independent when it comes to the vendors as well. Yes, we have everybody as a partner, but actually we work quite independently. So the advice that we provide is really. Um, based on our experience and what we see as the best fit for, for our customers. Uh, traditionally, they've kind of been more in the data center, but also now actually working in the cloud as well. So working with lots of organizations uh, in the cloud and helping them to actually migrate. I think probably the best kept secret actually of worldwide itself is the ATC, or the Adva Advanced Technology Center. So this was actually a... Um, an entire sort of data center that we have over in St. Louis. And uh, it was always there for customers to do POCs and POVs and benchmarking and things like that. And we recently actually turned it to face the outside world. So now it's available and accessible by everybody who registers on the World Wide website. Uh, so when you go to www.t.com, you can actually uh, register and then be able to access the ATC and all of the um, benchmarks, all of the POCs that we've done, all the shoot tests that we've done for customers are all now independently, uh, rather externally available. So you can actually look at uh, how the technology was used, how did we put it together, look at the documentation, look at this, uh, some of the engineers who actually worked on it, what were the combinations of technologies that we put together uh, for our customers. And the best thing about it is you can actually spin up these all of these workloads. So you can actually play with them yourself and experiment with them. So if you don't have that uh, ability in your own uh, organization, you can actually go to uh, the ATC and be able to spin up all the labs that we, are, you know, that we already have there. And we're constantly adding more and more of these uh, as they come online. So a really good, uh, really good resource uh, for technology uh, to, to experiment with. Okay, and then shameless plug number two. Um, I'm starting a quick vlog, so um, just kind of um, putting some... Uh, thoughts together. It's called the uh, Cloud Therapists, um, and we're just going to be really sort of talking about various different technologies, uh, just having a really a sort of an unofficial uh, discussion about various technologies. We'll hopefully, I have some. Um, um, guests on that as well. So I have managed to twist some arms in the industry, some some uh, vendor uh, contacts, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to uh, to progress that and um, get some more out there. Right, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? All right, this microphone is also on. Uh, first of all, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, you showed us a graph with uh, private cloud, public cloud. What is the data source for this graph? So, which one was that? Uh, your graphic, which we are, where you were showing trends for going like from on premise to the cloud, and that's the very beginning. Okay. Oh. Let me let me do it this way. <laughs> this one here. Yep. Uh, this one I think is uh, Gartner. Ah, okay. Thank yep. you. Any other questions? Yes. No. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. So just a question around multi-cloud um, in organizations. So a lot of organizations are trying to avoid vendor lock-in. So they're looking to put some of the application stack in AWS, maybe some in Azure, maybe some in GCP. Um, but of course, there's positives and negatives to that. I think from a regulatory side, maybe that's a, a positive. 
But from a data egress and from a cost economic perspective, that's, uh, that's something that could explode. Uh, what have you seen and what is your advice around that? Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, so I think the uh, what we're seeing is uh, certainly a, a move to you know to f for uh, for organisations to to have a multi-class strategy. I have to say, not everybody's there yet, but they are kind of looking at that, or perhaps they have you know production workloads in one and maybe dev workloads in in, in another. Um, the, I think the advice that we we probably tend to normally provide is that we actually say that um, organizations need to really look at uh, independent tooling when it comes to actually doing that. Uh, so if they you know want to move their workloads from one environment into another one, it's at least it's not necessarily straightforward and automated, but it's certainly easier to actually do that if you have third party tooling for things like automation, provisioning and, and so on. So if you're kind of going up you know going to put all your eggs in one basket and use the tools of you know one vendor, you uh, know, in uh, in terms of how you actually deploy your workloads, uh, then you're obviously reliant on on those tools, uh, you know, to to do the deployment. So actually, moving into another cloud is, is going to be difficult to do that. Uh, so probably actually a uh, good idea to look at third-party tools that are available uh, and use those because those will always remain independent, regardless of what's happening in that public cloud. That's one more question there. Wait, let me just grab so the, microphone. the microphone. This is for the recordings. You don't have to call me by full name, thank you very much. <laughs> um, hey. Um, hey, like for me, I mean, I'm working in a startup, I'm CTO of a startup. Yeah. And like one of the big questions that I guess I have is like, why would you go multi cloud in the first place? Um, sorry, can you, can you speak up? I can't hear you. Sorry, why would you go multi cloud in the first place? Because obviously, if you go multi-cloud, you can't use any P um, platform as services. You can't use any platform as services. Like, let's say you want to instead of you have a message queue, yeah, and instead of like Kafka, you use like PubSub, Google PubSub, or you use like um, Amazon Kinesis. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't use this in, multi, in a multi-cloud environment. Um, on the other hand, like you have all this like operations around like maintaining Kafka and all the things. So obviously, if you go multi-cloud, you can only do this in like an, I guess, open source environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess I'm like more generally asking like what are the benefits of like going multi-cloud other than like okay, Amazon it has this like one day in like every ten years where they go down. Yes, I, mean, I, I think if, if I understood your question correctly, I think that is a dilemma, uh, to be honest. So, so it's kind of dependent really on um, you know, a number of factors, everything from sort of costs to uh, the experience and the resources that you have. Uh, so if you have you know, a, a team that's kind of well-versed in open source and you know, they come from that background, uh, then they should be able to really um, you know, cater for that type of workload in the data center or wherever you want to put it, whether it's in a public cloud or private cloud or on top of a you know, hypervisor or whatever you want really in your data center. So th in, in that situation, you don't necessarily need to be in the cloud. If kind of, you know, um, you've got the skills and the capability to do that, then you can really spin that up you know, any, any way you like. The, the problem I think we, we find is that not everybody has that skill set and actually one of the things that worldwide technology does is staff augmentation. So we actually bring in specialists into a IT department or an IT team for an organization to actually help them do some of the designs, do some of the standing up of these workloads, do the migration and so on. And then we kind of do you know skills transfer and things like that and get them to you know uh, look after it. Uh, but that yeah so that I think depends on really uh, what kind of skill sets you have. And then I guess the, the second thing is you know um, uh, whether that workload you know does need to be touched, you know, regularly, or it's kind of something that you can just spin up and, and, and run it, just kind of runs happily wherever it is. So it, it's, it's a number of factors that, that will dictate that. So, answer your question? Not sure. See me afterwards. <laughs> if I didn't get yeah, all I've got that. time for one more question, and then we have to carry on to the next one. Okay, I'm not sure who had their hand up. That's the other person. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation, quite detailed. 
I was wondering, from your years of experience, what do you think is the biggest uh, hurdle? Let's say, for example, if a company approaches you, okay, we're trying to uh, do a digital transformation onto the cl cloud, right? Yeah. So what's the biggest hurdle? Is it that the uh, the upper level, uh, the uh, the executive level seems to don't, don't understand it, or is it that there's a communication gap between the IT department and uh, I mean the cloud? Um, okay, so if I, if I understood the question right, um, yeah, I mean I think there's, you know, in in the sort of in, in the data center, it's it's kind of a that sort of uh, shift in in terms of sort of mind and understanding of how. IT ought to be utilized. So kind of in, in the data center, sort of in, in the old days, um, you know, you had sort of technology where you know the the technology was designed to help the organization to to use IT to actually use technology. Whereas now, really, it it ought to be an enabler for the business. So it ought to you know allow things like innovation, flexibility, agility, and speed. You know, those are the things that it really needs to provide. For the for for the organisation, so if it's not doing that, it's still kind of it means that you're still kind of doing it in the old way. So, you know, the the, the thing to do there is to really try and engage with the uh, the rest of the organisation, with the stakeholders, uh, and see what is their requirement uh, prior to making a decision to you know going into the cloud or putting a workload in the cloud and so on. So, as I said earlier, it's not really just for the sake of it. You know, you kind of you know everyone's going to the cloud. CEO says. Let's go to the cloud, so we all go to the cloud and start our migration process. It's really about you know making sure that uh, if you are going to undertake that, and that is a really huge, you know, um, uh, process to, to actually start. I mean, some of the companies I'm working for, you know, working with rather, um, you know, doing sort of three to five year migrations, and it's not like a an overnight uh, sort of you know journey that you can take. Uh, so it's I think it's all about really. Um, IT becoming an enabler for the business rather, rather than just offering a service to the business. Okay. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, guys.